Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to today's CGS Thursday lecture series. Uh, my name is Reginald Jackson, and I'm director of the Center for Japanese Studies here at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, and I'm also associate professor of pre-modern Japanese literature and performance in the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures. Um, today, we look forward to hearing a talk by Dr. Jessica A. Fernandez de Lara Harada, our 2022-23 postdoctoral fellow, along with Ryan Yokota, here at the Center for Japanese Studies. Um, and this lecture is co-sponsored by the University of Michigan Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. So we're really thankful for Lex uh, for kind of joining us in supporting uh, Jessica's talk today. So I'm very excited to introduce you to today's speaker, but first some general announcements. So please join us next week um, for the anatomy of loneliness, suicide, social connection, and the search for relational meaning in contemporary Japan, which will be given by Chikako Ozawa de Silva, professor of anthropology at Emory University. It'll be next week, same time, noon. Um, um, so you can check us out there. Also, please mark your calendars for the evening of October 13th, when CGS will be collaborating with the Michigan Theater to bring you a screening of the 1926 avant-garde film, A Page of Madness, featuring a live onstage narration by professional Benshi, visiting from Japan, Ms. Um, Nanako Yamauchi. Um, and also she'll be joined by the Detroit-based musician trio Little Bang Theory, which will be um, performing a live score that was composed originally for this film. And they'll be doing this on live, live on stage as well. So it should be great, those of you who are film buffs or music or performance buffs, admission is free. Um, and we hope to see many of you there. So please come out for that. This will kick off our film series. Um, so hopefully you can check, check out some of the other offerings in that series as well. For those of these, uh, for those of you who are attending uh, via webinar, um, please notice that webcams and microphones have been muted, but we do invite you to use the Q&A function during the lecture, which can be found at the bottom of your screen near the right-hand side, to submit any questions you have um, with the Q&A function. And we'll try our best to address as many of those questions as possible. Since we're doing a hybrid format, we'll take questions both from the audience that's here live with us and also those of you online. The live transcription or closed caption function will also be enabled. Um, but if you'd rather not have it, um, you can just go to the bottom right corner of your screen and disable that. We'd also like to encourage you to check out our CGS events page at slash U of M or various social media for CGS lectures that are scheduled for fall of 2022. Great. Uh, with that said, today it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jessica A. Fernandez de Lara Harada, one of our two 2022-23 postdoctoral fellows for the Center for Japanese Studies here. Uh, Dr. Fernandez de Lara Harada uh, earned her doctorate from the University of Cambridge just recently, where she was a Gates Cambridge scholar with a dissertation entitled Becoming Mexican and Japanese, a trans-specific social history of race, mestizaje, and resistance across five generations. Her doctoral research examined the overlooked historical experiences of Mexicans of Japanese origin across five generations in relation to the mestizo racial system, along with citizenship and state violence, as well as repertories of resistance in, Mex in Mexico. This study built upon her master's dissertation on graphic novel representations of mestizaje, the positioning of Afro-descendants in Latin America, and the operation of race and racism in Mexico, from a transnational lens. Her research interests also include trans-Pacific history, nation state building, colonial formations in Mexico and Japan, and overlooked histories of marginal migrants and ethnic minorities. She writes, quote, this history of migration, nation, and race allow us to reflect on the position of Asians in the quote, colonial division of humanity, according to which liberal modes of distinction privilege particular lives as human and treat others as laboring, replaceable, or disposable citing Lisa Lowe from 2015 and Intimacies of Four Continents. This hemispheric exclusion of Asians makes his framework applicable to the Latin American context. This entangled history reveals the inclusion of Asians as laborers in the Mexican national economic sphere. But as we see in the pieces um, of this cluster, they often confront racialized exclusion from political citizenship and participation in the national political and cultural space as either non-citizen, model minority, or fetish capital. This ambiguity is compounded by mestizaje, which allows a relative degree of fluidity, affinity, and mutuality toward different groups, depending on specific family histories and social contexts. Previously, um, Dr. Fernandez de Lara Harada completed an MA in Latin American Studies with distinction at the University, of College, uh, University College London, and also a BA first-class honors in law at Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. 
He was a research fellow at the Center for Historical Studies at uh, El Colegio de Mex Mexico, um, co-founder of the Crash Research Group, Power and Vision, The Camera is Pol Political Technology, and an organizer of the conference Memories in Transit, which was supported by the Center for the Study of Global Human Movement at the University of Cambridge, along with the British Academy. She has won fellowships from the Higher Education Academy um, as part of the UK Professional Standards Framework for Teaching and Learning Support in Higher Education for proven leadership and excellence in teaching and learning. And she's also served as a visiting scholar at El Colegio de Mexico's Center for Historical Studies from February 2018 to July 2018. She's taught as a lecturer um, at the University of Cambridge in sociology and in Latin American studies, and has been a key collaborator and organizer of numerous panels, including CLAS Cambridge um, and uh, PUIC series of conferences, Africans and Asians in the Americas, New Perspectives, uh, convener for the panel, Colonial Borderlands, Nationalism and Foreign Others, Mobility Controls, Practices of Citizenship, and the Definition of Marginal Subjects in the 20th Century, um, and also the panel uh, for SLAS um, on Methodologies in Displacement, Writing Through Texts, Autoethnographic Gestures, and Affective Traces. In terms of her professional service, Dr. Fernandez de Lara Harada has been a board member of the Cambridge Migration Society, a founding member of the Cambridge Migration Working Group, president of the Cambridge University Mexican Society, and also president of the 17th Symposium of Mexican Studies and Students in the UK. I can say that when the Postdoctoral Fellowship Selection Committee reviewed the dozens of applications from around the world, we were impressed by the quality of Dr. Fernandez de Lara Harada's scholarship, but also the palpable extent of her commitments to advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion work within university settings and her local communities. She's worked both formally and informally to make space for minoritized scholars within the UK. And her work challenges the bad habits inherited in spaces where DEI work tends to take place more as window dressing than as focused action. This is included for her volunteering for Crisis, a homeless charity, both in London and other places um, where she's helped um, people from her neighborhood who live in precarious circumstances by engaging them in social activities and providing safe spaces. I had the pleasure of first learning about Jessica's work in the context of the Japanese Studies for Anti-Racist Pedagogy uh, series. We have one of our members here, Harrison Watson. Um, uh, and in that context, um, she was a devoted attendee uh, when we were just starting up this program and consistently posed trenchant questions to our speakers. Um, there was no money involved. She just happened to show up and be a really great participant, which I appreciate. Uh, this proactive engagement led to her application to the Japanese Studies Anti-Racist Pedagogy um, Graduate Syllabus Workshop, where she proved an active, respectful, and generous interlocutor among her student and faculty colleagues. Anecdotally, it's also worth mentioning that Dr. Fernandez de Lara Harada was the first to apply to our JSAP Graduate Syllabus Workshop, and those of us reviewing the applications were shocked in a great way by what we read. Uh, even amongst a calendar group of graduate students from North America, Japan, and Europe, in terms of its thoughtfulness, conceptual sophistication, and polish, her application set the bar for all the others. So uh, Rachel uh, Willis and Sophie Hasuo, along with Harrison, we read those applications um, and were really kind of impressed by that and realized that no one, <laughs> well, it's not fair to say, most of the other applicants were, were in for um, some trouble because Jessica had set the bar so high that we didn't know um, how many people we'd want to accept after we read her application. And that's true. So sorry to embarrass you, but that's, Sophie was like, it doesn't get much better. Where is she? And why have you never heard of this person before? So um, I think that by exploring neglected and under-theorized transnational connections between Japan and Latin America, Jessica's work pushes those of us in more traditional sectors of Japanese studies to reconsider what Japanese-ness means, how it travels, and what it excludes. This is exciting as a provocation for us to think differently and to teach differently. And I'm jealous of any of you who happen to be taking her seminar this semester. Those of you who aren't, know that she'll be teaching next semester um, between Latin American studies and Japanese studies. So please, those of you who are nodding over there, please take her class. Uh, in this regard, I think that um, Professor uh, Fernandez de Lara Harada joins uh, really great scholars like Andrea Mendoza and Jin Young Veronica Kim in contributing exciting research that forces a rethinking of the methodological tendencies and political stakes of comparison that divests from area studies paradigms. I think we're therefore very lucky to have her in our midst and to have her join us um, here as a member of our CGS community and to teach our students. So um, with that, I want to just uh, really kind of thank Jessica uh, for being with us here and then um, helping us think about 
as we think about the 75th uh, anniversary and of what the next 75 years might look like if we have more scholars like her to kind of expand what Japanese studies could be and mean. So today, Dr. Fernandez de la Harada will be presenting a talk entitled Racism, Mestizaje, and the American World War II Ethnic Cleansing of Latin American Japanese. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Jessica A. Fernandez de la Harada. So first, uh, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with foreign English languages like mine, um, perhaps you might be interested in reading this uh, wonderful article by Ali Meiji, one of my colleagues from Cambridge, um, who uh, defines white ignorance uh, rather than a lack of knowledge as a form of knowledge that is put to use in reproducing white privilege and supremacy. And so uh, if you ever struggle understanding people's um, ways of speaking or thinking, then you may want to think about what's the use of that. Secondly, I would like to, um, um, yes, to draw your attention to the disruptive presence that anomalies are. And um, what am I doing in Japanese studies, for example? What counts as expertise on Japanese studies? And who has written the Japanese field? Becoming a subject rather than an object of epistemic extraction is likely to elicit very violent reactions, as this means displacing the normative focus on a of analysis from the other minority to the systems and actors producing such differences and others in the first place. In this vein, I want to, um, I want to mention uh, that in the context of uh, Japanese Americans in the US in particular, as many scholars like Barner have documented, social, social scientists have been part of the state surveillance machine and complicit in advancing its objectives at the expense of people who have already been victims to justice and oppression. With this in mind, I want to state explicitly that I do not represent anyone but myself. I am a Mexican citizen. Um, I have been living in the UK for the last 10 years, a third of my life. I do not identify as Nikkei and I am not Japanese. I come from a different place to Asian Americans in the United States. In Mexico, a colonial place Access to education is much more limited than in the United States, a hegemonic empire. In the latter, the struggles and partial successes for obtaining redress for Japanese Americans, establishing ethnic studies and creating the field of Asian American studies have not yet been gained in Mexico. While a USA citizen can study any and all of these fields combined, even by joining the US Army if they are born in a precarious position. It has taken me very different paths and a third of my life to be able to learn about the Japanese in the Americas and to learn the history of Japanese Mexicans. We can see how our position within the empire and outside of it in the colonies significantly impart inequalities in education broadly, but also in English language the global hegemonic language that shapes education, languages, and area studies. As Sylvia Winter posits, incoming white and non-black groups who claim normal North American identity, that is normal human status as the hegemonic global norm, might study other so-called minority people as a curiosity, as an anomaly, as an object of research. But the other's knowledge and experiences will be questioned as though someone else could understand the other lives better than themselves. This matters not only in relation to my positionality, but also to explain how the histories of Latin American Japanese, including Mexican Japanese, outside the United States of America, have so far been buried alive and passed down without closure open to understanding of other people's wounds. With these cautionary notes, let me share these poems as a prelude to this lecture's introduction. <laughs> 
Breaking the silence, honored by our ancestors, is a lamentation, not of battles lost or won, but a remembrance of the lives of those who have passed before us. Breaking the silence is also a tribute to their perseverance. We do this not to rake up all coals, but to see with new eyes the past can no more be denied. Rather than seeking to rake up all coals, as Nojima writes, I wonder what does it mean to inherit a disciplinary formation in the context of Japanese studies in the US. As Professor Reginald Jackson and Professor Harutunian mentioned in their conversation as part of this seminar series, quote, the stakes of producing research on Japan were determined by language necessities. There were a number of things that were done by those experts to enshrine the American occupation of Japan. It is a part of its experience and formation. The other thing, it was to lessen the experience or the episode of the war itself. The whole problem of developing a program called the modernization of Japan starts in the 1950s and 1960s. It was designed to diminish the memory of the war, the experiences of the war, compared with, the, with, with what the Japanese were doing, memory, war experience, and so on. They were worlds apart. There was an irony operating because the bulk of people involved were involved in the war itself. Language, translators. It was the war that created Japanese studies. But on the other hand, there were attempts to deface the field. Those were the stakes, end of quote. Japanese studies is founded on Anglo-American colonialism of Asia, which connects it with earlier histories of Iberian American colonialism of Latin America. Japanese language and Japanese people who spoke it were sometimes used as a means of control, of surveillance, of domination, even against those same people who were natives to it. In this poem, Yanis Mirikitani, a uh, Japanese Okinawan third generation um, sensei, expresses her mother's experience of feeling dehumanized and isolated from the world. How can you exist without a voice? Silence as the loss of self-image, as the only way to express oneself. How can we testify and bear witness to the testimony of the rightless? I will return to these themes throughout this lecture, but first let me give an introduction and an overview of it. There is a growing consensus in critical studies of race that European imperialism, colonialism, and capitalism are con constitutive of the modern world. Racism in particular is generally deemed a system of structural inequalities rooted in European colonialism of the rest of the world, which also underpins the mestizaje racial system in Latin America. However, my work shows that Western global racism did not override previous systems of relations, nor did they preclude new ones. For example, Chinese pre-European East Asian hierarchies, which place the Japanese in an inferior position and have been cons consistently contested by the Japanese, still shape both experiences of racism in Latin America and injustice struggles, as I discuss later. Palimpsestic interimperial rivalries, colonial structures, and racialized national formations have shaped my research in various ways. Altogether, they have suppressed the historical experiences of people of Japanese origin and marginalized them from dominant discourses of nation, race, and citizenship in Latin America. Latin American dominant discourses on nation, race, and citizenship are defined by mestizaje. Generally, these discourses claim that mestizaje erases racial divides and hierarchies through the racial mixture between European Spanish settlers and Amerindian Indian people. Mestizaje has been defined as an elite and hegemonic ideology that conceals and perpetuates mixed race racism and reflects actual mixed race experiences. <clears throat> 
However, I argue that these ideological definitions fail to tackle the systemic and structural racism underpinning mestizaje. My thesis defines mestizaje as a racial system that developed from European, particularly Iberian and Anglo-American durable settler colonial structures. The racial system of mestizaje is premised on and operates through the replacement of indigenous peoples, the appropriation of slaves and immigrant labor, and the government and control of resources by Ibero and Anglo-American dominant elites. In this lecture, First, I will provide a brief overview of anti-Japanese policies, persecution, and concentration in Latin America. This overview draws on existing literature, including a critical comparative study entitled Separate National Apologies, Transnational Injustices, Second World War Oppression, Anti-Japanese Persecution, and the Politics of, of Apology in Five Countries, which I co-authored with leading scholars in this field, and is currently under peer review. It is the second article mentioned there. While I draw on key aspects of, of some of these um, studies that are connected to my work, all errors in interpretation are solely mine. Second, I will share some findings of my doctoral research entitled Becoming Japanese and Mexican, a Trans-Pacific Social History of Race, Mestizaje, and Resistance Across Five Generations which I completed recently, and, I'm, and at present I'm currently transforming into a book monograph. This is therefore still work in progress. My findings aim to provide the contours of the shape that the concentration of people of Japanese origins took in the specific context of Mexico and point towards more questions that need to be tackled. Third and lastly, by way of conclusions, I reflect on my role in the Center for Japanese Studies at the University of Michigan, the university's historical ties to US colonialism and the hemispheric and trans-Pacific anti-Japanese policies that my work engages with, and whether it is possible to transform or reform this institutional setting, given its long and ongoing histories, which led to the situation of rightlessness for people like me in Mexico. So first, uh, transnational injustices. During the Second World War, at least 17 American countries in its Latu Sensu, because America is a very big continent and it's not only the US, were complicit with the Washington US-led hemispheric policy of persecution, concentration, and dispossession of people of Japanese origins on eugenic, unfounded insecurity and racist grounds to fortify white supremacy in the American continent. Besides the United States, these countries included Brazil, Bolivia, Canada, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, and Peru. Some of them, particularly Canada, Cuba, Mexico, and the United States established their own war concentration systems. While other countries, most notably Peru, also cooperated with the US hemispheric policy of illegal kidnapping, deportation, and incarceration in US concentration camps. Nearly 50 years later, in 1988, the US Congress signed into law the Federal Civil Liberties Act. It granted a formal apology to Japanese Americans in the US. The act cited racial prejudice, wartime hysteria, and a lack of political leadership as causes for the incarceration. It recognized that the US had acted without proof of security reasons, acts of espionage or sabotage, and motivated purely by racism. In 1988, Canada also apologized for the total dispossession of their Japanese Canadian victims. The US and Canada offered symbolic compensation to them. Brazil and Peru offered only semi-official apologies. Many states like Mexico orchestrated the racially motivated ethnic cleansing of people of Japanese origin before the World War II. Some, some scholars, for example, the 
the co-authors of the article that I mentioned before, have begun to conceptualize the acts leading and comprising the concentration as genocide, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity here to eliminate people of Japanese origin from the national bodies of American states united by white supremacy. For example, Cousin, uh, who appears in the first article mentioned there on traces of the Trans-Pacific US Empire, challenges the internment narratives that framed the treatment of the Japanese across the Western Hemisphere during the Second World War. It argues that this history reveals how the US Empire globalized militarized violence, uh, how the US Empire globalized militarized violence operates. It demonstrates that the Second World War experiences of 2,264 kidnapped Japanese Latin Americans as ghostly figures render visible the long durée US imperialism in Asia and Latin America and its many illegible and non-redressable victims. Um, the, the, the article uh, by James Izumi Okamoto, Stanger Ross, and myself offers a preliminary account highlighting some of the key transnational factors involved in the injustices produced by anti-Japanese racism and whether the possible spread of apology politics from the US and Canadian cases to Brazil, Mexico, and Australia might help to promote a new political awareness of the transnational character of the wartime oppression of Japanese civilians in allied countries. Um, Anti-Japanese racism uh, uh, developed decades before the onset of the Second World War in these cases. And, um, as a, as a, and the Japanese were portrayed as an inassimilable menace to white dominated settler colonial states. And the US leadership was particularly influential in these developments across the hemisphere. These individual country cases reveal important variations uh, in terms of the, way, the, way, the, the forms that the incarceration of peoples of Japanese ancestry took, um, the intracommunal dynamics between them, and the degrees of dispossession that they faced, as well as the reparations that they achieved. If, at all. But the similarities are also very important. Most of them were uh, racialized before the war as uh, enemies, but also as unassimilable um, threats. And, um, and this is connected to uh, Latin American countries and other uh, white settler colonial spaces uh, with, with the US. With, the, with their geopolitical alliance with the US and its wartime policies of mass dispossession. In all of these cases, um, the other citizens of the other Axis countries, particularly Italian and German communities, were not subjected to such categorically racist and discriminatory treatment. This uh, basic fact underscored the profound significance of the transnational anti-Japanese racializing discourses, which were institutionalized by a law and policy in diverse, in diverse set, settler pol polities in the decades leading up to the Second World War. There are also other studies that illuminate similar experiences and practices um, in other countries. For example, um, the Mexican state has partly acknowledged how um, the, its wartime policies and concentration system led to the development of a totalitarian state that still is claiming the lives of many uh, extrajudicially killed and disappeared people in Mexico. Um, in Chile, there has been this book, the second one, La, Guerra, La Olvidada Guerra contra Japón, that documents also uh, the policies of anti-Japanese persecution and disappearance um, in a different medium, uh, there have been people who have uh, recorded the experiences of the war and the concentration in other settings. For example, uh, Kaori Flores Yonekura in her film Nikkei, Un Viaje Extraordinario, also speaks about the concentration of people of Japanese origin in Venezuela. And uh, lastly, uh, in, in Brazil, which I mentioned before, 
uh, there has been a partial reckoning with these wrongs as the Brazilian government has informally apologized to the Japanese Brazilian community. This image is actually quite interesting. It, 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 I, I found it in the Guardian, a UK newspaper, and they chose to show the emperor. Um, so from the, from the recollections that we have found, many Brazilian people were asked to, uh, to walk over this image during the war, which actually made me think a lot about um, the ways in which um, Christians were asked to do the same with Christ and with the image of Christ in Japan in the 16th century. So it seems almost like a, a revengeful scenario or something like that. Um, yet in the particular context of Mexico, we still need further research to address pressing questions. I'm just going to have a, a little bit of water, sorry. The paradox of rights of Latin American Japanese is that they are conflated with a just war that must be forgotten. Therefore, they become disposable subjects. There is also a global color line in the distribution of human rights, which rests on the racialization of the notion of human itself, so that populations not considered human are considered inherently rightless. US anti-Asian racism informed Mexican immigration laws, policies, and the war concentration system. From the early, from early 19th to the early 20th centuries, Mexico had few migration regulations that only discouraged the entry of lazy people, criminals, and non-Catholic groups. The, the 1899 Pan American Union and its 1902 sanitary office established in Washington, US, informed Latin American eugenics and immigration regulations. Since 1903, they attributed sanitary concerns to Asians, including the Japanese, fostering racist commissions policies and laws that were central to the elimination of the Japanese through the war concentration system in Mexico. Eugenics, epidemics, and fears of an invasion prompted Mexico to limit the entry of Asians and then foreigners in general. The coloniality of mestizaje, uh, which is a term that I'm happy to discuss later, uh, that I coined in my work, operates through these legal and policy logics to reproduce the mestizo settler colonial state. Scott Fitzgerald and Cook Martin show that at least until 2010, that is maybe 12 years ago, 16 Latin American countries maintained naturalization laws that gave preferential treatment to Spanish, Portuguese, and Latin Americans based on a racialized cultural criteria and established a racist hierarchy with Iberians at the top and Asians and Blacks at the bottom. As the latter disrupt the mestizo system, they are ascribed a foreign status and excluded from entry and or participation in the nation. Although Mexico is the four, fourth main, re, main receiving country of the Japanese diaspora in Latin America, it has distinctive characteristics. As Tigner indicates in his survey of Japanese immigrants in Latin America, the Japanese in Mexico were different from other countries. They reached only 15,000 before the Second World War, and after it, their number, he writes, including their descendants, was reduced to 4,000. Well, in other Latin American countries, particularly Brazil and Peru, their income and standard of living may be above the average. In Mexico, people of Japanese origins remain an exception as they have not achieved the same success, continue to be employed by Mexicans and work in low paid positions. Tigner, who actually was a, an agent of the US, right? Um, and you can see that even in his writing, no? very objective, very descriptive. Um, 
And he, I think he planned also Okinawan migration to Bali Bolivia after the occupation and so on. So you can see the entanglement of Japanese stu uh, studies, the US and its colonial and genocidal projects. Um, Tigner acknowledges that the precarious economic status of Japanese Mexicans was caused by the Mexican revolution, racism and discrimination which further the racial and cultural assimilation through intermarriage. So it is not uh, random that, that I'm part of that story as well. However, existing studies fail to explain what produced such precariousness. And more studies are needed to explain the impact of these factors on the economic, social, and political rights and participation of Mexicans of Japanese origins and to indicate the, the discontinuities with other cases. The historical experience of Mexicans of Japanese ancestry can be traced back to the 16th century European global expansion, Iberian colonization of Avia Yala, presently known as America, and Swedes of the Pacific Ocean, and the Spanish-Mexican importation of Asian slaves. It has continued into the present as an important element in the construction of the Mexican nation. The presence of the Japanese resurfaces after Mexican independence through contract labor, anti-Asian anti racism, and World War II. In these periods, the ongoing expansion of Western capitalism, built on racialized regimes of accumulation and dispossession, demanded Japanese immigrants for plantations, mines, and railroads owned mostly by US capital. Their displacement coincided with Japan's modernization, industrialization, and expansion. As a corollary, Japanese migration to the Americas developed in a context of anti-Japanese racism. This context influenced the Mexican state eugenic population and migration policies that I mentioned before, which my thesis argued, um, enabled the Mexican state to execute the elimination of Mexican Japanese from the Mexican Revolution to the Second World War under the veil of a state of war. My research on Mexican Japanese experiences of mestizaje began with resonant yet distinct absences from those of Japanese Americans in the United States. For example, one of my research participants uh, told me, in my family, we never considered ourselves as part of a Nikkei community. But in any case, to be descendants was something that made us proud, but we did not feel like hers. It had a lot to do with the breaking of the family bond due to the death of my great grandfather, who was Japanese, when my grandfather was six years old. He was orphaned of his father and mother at a very young age. So I assume that this is where the lack of organic links with a Japanese core comes from. Do you know why your, father, your grandfather died, if I may ask? No, he doesn't remember. My grandfather didn't remember because he was very young and I imagine it was very shocking. And my great grandmother died when he was about nine years old. So all the information from an adult world died with the two of them for him. It was very, very unfortunate. So as the link was broken and he rather dedicated himself to work and not necessarily with the community, but in general, he looked for whoever he could. And I understand that he also experienced a process of very strong discrimination due to his Japanese heritage and indigenous heritage as well, because he had both. So that like myself, without talking about it and without knowing it, because he's also already dead, but I assume that he tried to blur their relationship a bit. Thinking through embodied histories is a critical interrogation of most scholarship on racism and mestizaje that, ignore or minim that ignores or minimizes structural anti-Japanese racism. Asian Japanese Latin American migrations and ethnicities, and actual Asian Japanese life experiences. My research recovers these intimate and familiar oral life histories that are absent from dominant renditions of national histories. However, these are national and transnational histories 
that seek to radically shift our perspectives and understandings of race, ethnicity, nation, citizenship, and racism. Chapter four of my thesis builds on the coloniality of mestizaje to connect histories of mestizo violence and anti-Japanese racism. It draws on the analysis of Mexican, Japanese, and Portuguese archival sources and oral life histories interviews with sur surviving Issei and Issei, first and second generations, who directly experienced the war in Mexico. Previous works documented some, ac some aspects of the Mexican government's forced removal of Mexican Japanese from their homes, concentration and suspension and violation of rights during the war. However, they generally treat these experiences as sui generis on the idea that the Japanese in Mexico received a positive treatment. For instance, Perdi argues that there is no evidence of an economic or racial rationale to Mexico's World War II policies against the Japanese, as Japanese immigrants had forged, had quote, forged a positive image in their Mexican neighbors due to their industriousness, honesty, and commitment to the development and well being of Mexico, end of quote. Similarly, Garcia, who is also, I think, has a background in the US military, argues that Japanese Mexicans were protected from hostility due to their integration to Mexican society through mestizaje, mutual aid societies, and their proximity to whiteness due to the modern military and economic power of the Japanese state. This perceived proximity to whiteness refers to Japan as a competing nation state model, I argue not necessarily to individuals of Japanese origin. I argue that this ascribed proximity to whiteness, which is never quite whiteness, is a state of non-personhood because it obliterates actual individual life experiences that exist outside of white, widely circulated representations of Japan. These studies reflect Japanese and Mexican elites perspectives disregarding the long history of anti-Asian racism in Mexico. In contrast, Chu argues that the hemispheric concentration of people of Japanese origin during the Second World War was a racial project. This historian argues that the Mexican state ignored prisoners of war protections in overt violation of Japanese immigrants and their Mexican families' rights. This left them vulnerable to violations by the Mexican state and other individuals. This discussion brings to light an actionable strategy planned by Mexican state officials who were active in eugenesis population and migration control federal state bodies to expel Chinos, uh, quote, um, from the national body and the use of concentration camps as an important mechanism to facilitate this process. So the, the history of the racialization of Asians as Chinos, uh, which is a category that encompasses basically everyone from East Asia, has a long history that is rooted in Iberian colonialism and enslavement of Asians. And um, it, it, it reappears constantly in, these in the archival sources that I consulted to refer not only to Chino as a national category, but to refer to all East Asians, including the Japanese as a racial category. The previous statement, uh, sorry, this statement shows Mexican officials' awareness of the validity that international wars can lend to the use of the concentration system. And it foresees that agricultural works can disguise the forced labor imposed on um, Chinese people concentrated in the camps, supposedly for their subsistence while they await their expulsion. However, this plan was applied specifically to people of Japanese origin, evincing the ambiguities of the term. Evinc ev evincing the ambiguities of the term Chino deployed by Mexican officials committed to anti Asian racism. My study contends that the Mexican state was the main actor in the racial project of the concentration of people of Japanese origin in Mexico. The Mexican federal state 
coordinated national, local, and municipal state government, the federal army, who liaised with the US Army at the time, and the Ministry of Interior's Population Department, and the DIPS, which was the Department of uh, Pol Political, Social and Political Affairs. This department was an emergent state intelligence agency and state police that operated mostly with unprofessional and corrupt secret agents. The Mexican state also instrumentalized segments of Japanese communities to execute its policies of labor appropriation and elimination of Japanese Mexicans. The Mexican state created a context against the Japanese that led to intra-community tensions among, among Mexican Japanese given the limitations on resources to subsist. Therefore, there are varied and uneven experiences of the war. In this manner, the Mexican state implicated various actors, including Japanese and Mexican ordinary people. This constellation has concealed Mexican state genocidal practices. Um, my work shows that the Mexican state de deployed specific practices of anti-Japanese racism to classify, as we can see in this uh, identification card, manage and subordinate people of Japanese origin. It demonstrates that the post-revolutionary Mexican state racialized the Japanese as undesirable foreigners to, el to eliminate them through the war concentration system, leading to their genocide during the Second World War. Between 6,000 and 15,000 people of Japanese origin in Mexico were impacted by these measures. This racial project led to a situation of rightlessness for people of Japanese origin in Mexico and their families. Furthermore, um, the, the Japanese community in, in Mexico um, created a mutual aid committee. Um, with the agreement of both the Mexican and the Japanese governments. And the aid that it mobilized, including the purchase and administration of haciendas, um, were used uh, to, to, to implement some of these policies. The haciendas or ranches were Mexican sui generis concentration camps for people of Japanese origin under Mexican state and semi independent control. The haciendas are large landed estates, population concentrations, and production units worked by slaves, in debt peons, and coerced laborers. They are a central economic and social institution of the Mexican land labor regime, agrarian structures, and rural society. They are also a feudal legacy of the Spanish colonial system and continue to operate in the present. In these haciendas, uh, the Japanese were sent to, 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 to work, not only for, um, for ordinary Mexicans, but most importantly for um, Mexican state officials that included um, even the Mexican president at the time and their, their presidential officers and Mexican state governors in various locations. And um, there are very few testimonies that emerge from these practices, but we can still trace them, like the, like the case of um, Jose Chotiro Yokoyama and his wife, Umeyo Kamoto, uh, who managed to um, appear on the records. Um, they were both naturalized Mexicans at the start of the war, and their children, Miko and Yoshiko, who were born in Mexico, were displaced from Me Mexicali, Baja California in the, in the border with the US. The request to move to Ta Tapachula in the south of Mexico, which was supposedly protected from some of these measures, um, and I can talk about that later, was approved by this uh, state agency that I mentioned before, the DIPS. But on their journey, they were arbitrarily detained by army officials from the Nayarit government, which is in the Pacific coast. State officials recorded that Yokoyama 
seemed suspicious to them because he insisted on returning to Japan. Yokoyama's wife and children then vanished from the records, leaving only a photograph of them shown here during their detention. The parents' gazes convey worry and the children appear fearful and distrustful. Afterward, Yokoyama was incarcerated until the Ministry of Interior requested his presence in Mexico City. The photograph in the left uh, registers an expression that escapes words and history. After that, he was sent to Guadalajara, then to Temixco, and finally, he also disappeared from the records. His family was lost too. There was nothing suspicious about his desire to return with his family to Japan. The, the Japanese had sent various letters to the Portuguese embassy asking Japan to repatriate as many as 4,000 destitute Japanese due to the dire conditions in Mexico. So as I am running out of time, I'm just going to um, begin my conclusions. These ongoing histories, as we continue remembering, unforgetting, and writing about them in the present, reveal the cracks of Western teleological narratives, as though time, change, and progress followed a linear progression uninterrupted. These histories interrupt such fiction. They remind us that practices of rightlessness, indefinite detention, and extrajudicial killings and disappearances against those demonized as the dangerous, as people of Japanese origins were before, during and after the war, have not only been maintained, but they have become even more brutal. Despite the US redress to Japanese Americans uh, in stricter sense that is comprising only those in the US, um, the experiences of people of Japanese origin in other sites discussed in this lecture, Mexican Japanese, Peruvian Japanese, Brazilian Japanese, Australian Japanese, Canadian Japanese, among the countless other ghostly figures of US violence, show that there is not a beginning and end to it, as we would like to believe. The history of dispossession, appropriation, and elimination has a longer history within Latin America, the Americas as a whole, and Asia, that implicates several state and non-state actors, including those who have chosen to remain complicit in denial or in disavowal. Before I conclude, I want to share with you one of many experiences here in the US that also show this unfinished struggle. Japanese Americans from across the US are here opposing the Trump administration's incarceration of 1,400 asylum seekers seeking immigrant children at Fort Seal in Oklahoma, a former US Army camp that imprisoned Japanese Americans during the Second World War and the Chiricahua Apache tribe who were also forcibly removed from the Southwest. But differences remain. Being at the center of the US empire or in the North Atlantic is not the same as being in its periphery, the same way that being in the center of the periphery is not the same as being in the periphery of the periphery. How do we move from here? What does it mean to have, or rather to build a community? When faced with racism, state violence, and genocide, it is hard to expect people who have been their victims to simply be trustful. More needs to be done. Trust, need, trust needs to be built, even if at times it seems unachievable. But we may only be able to build trust if we are to take account of our own positions in history and our present context and how this might change when we move to other spaces. This movement, rather than relativizing struggles, might help us to see and think and feel from other perspectives, the experiences of others. As such, with a um, multi-ocular ocular perspective, rather than a single vision, instead of disavowing shared struggles, we might be able to recognize and acknowledge each of them with the differences and similarities instead of looking into the differences and similarities within ourselves. And this brings me back 
to Mexico and the apologies that were offered by the, by the current Mexican president um, regarding the massacre or the pogroms of Chinese people in during the Mexican Revolution, uh, how many Mexican Chinese communities and Chinese people have been advocating for the, but oftentimes at the expense of obscuring other similar crimes because of the tensions between Japan, China, South Korea, and so on, have also uh, limited these struggles in other contexts like Mexico. And lastly, as Professor Reginald Jackson mentioned, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very fascinated by the work that um, Jung Jung, Veronica Kim, Rachel Lim, and Andrea Mendoza are doing to connect seemingly disconnected histories. And um, Asian studies, Asian American studies, and Asian Latin American studies, um, as especially as the margins or in the margins, are very important because they show the cracks of all these discourses and the inequalities that fall within them. The margins force us to open up unwillingly to differences. And as um, Veronica Kim also indicates, um, disobeying the borders of knowledge production also interrupts Western epistemes that dominate our understanding of these issues. So thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, uh, Jessica, for that really fascinating talk. I learned a lot. And um, now I'd like to uh, invite folks here in the audience or folks that are on um, online as well to continue to submit questions. Um, we have our own Yudi Fukazawa who has a mic. So um, if people here would like to take a moment to gather thoughts and ask questions, that's great. Otherwise we have several questions uh, from the online folks that I'm happy to start with. So maybe I'll start there then, uh, Jessica. Uh, so I'll start with a question from uh, one of our attendees online. Uh, this is Benjamin Ireland, who says, Professor, thank you for your fascinating research presentation. I was wondering if you could comment on the Mexican state's entanglements with non-US and non-British empires, such as Nazi-influenced French and Vichy empires that promoted colonial anti-Japanese citizenship practices against mixed-race Japanese and created concentration camps such as those in Australia. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Benjamin, for that question. I am afraid that I do not know much about, about that topic, but I would very much like to, to hear more about it. So please, if you have any links, and if you can share them, that, that would be great. Um, yes, I mean, there is, there is a lot to say about uh, the empires that have intervened in Mexico or in Latin America. So it is obviously not only the US, but there have been previous interventions, the longest one probably by um, the Spanish. But after that, we also had a French empire uh, just after independence. And um, yes, I think that is why thinking about palincestic uh, colonial formations is so important in these settings that, are, that have multiple layers of, of empire. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's another question. This one is from uh, Nathan Elstrand, who asks, what steps should the Mexican government take to confront its past in regards to Japanese migrants? Oh, hi, Nathan. Thank you so much for that question. Um, well, in, in the article that I mentioned that I wrote with um, my colleagues on national apologies, we were also discussing the potential of apologies to repair these wrongs. And it seems very limited in, in many ways, because they tend to be symbolic. They may give a certain status to the Japanese in Mexicans as deserving of rights, but we know that the notion of rights in itself is very limited, right? It comes at the expense of the rightless. Uh, so even if these apologies were to be uh, offered, as they have been in the case of the uh, Chinese Mexicans, that doesn't mean that there is a reparation or that uh, the situation of rightlessness um, is, not is not replicated against other groups. So I think an acknowledgement would be very important, but we also need to continue doing this research. At the moment, uh, Mexico established a truth commission for the first time, and they are examining state crimes. But I think, and you probably know this better than I, but um, this commission is examining state crimes from the 60s to the present. So they intently avoided this period, which actually good 
contradict many of the principles that sustain Mexican nationalism, right? It is built on uh, the supposedly liberal aspects of uh, the Mexican revolution, which actually was a nationalist movement that reproduced many of the things that they were trying to combat, including racism and violence. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you so much for that, that thoughtful answer. So we have a question here from a member of the audience, the live audience. I know you can hear me, but I don't. Is, okay. Um, oh my goodness. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I feel like I would to hear you talk for hours and hours and hours. So the good news is it's the beginning of the year and hopefully you have energy and you're willing to, to share more as we go through the year. Um, I have a lot of questions and I, I think I'll just limit it to two and you don't have, you can pick between them. Um, the first was, was about the, the research that you did and the archives um, and it, maybe I'm projecting onto you, but I feel like it must have been difficult research for a lot of reasons, partially for the emotions and the sadness and the pain that you're 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 confirming, but also because it seems like you're mostly focusing on absences and silences and things that were expressly and intentionally hidden by the state, by very powerful actors, and also maybe even within families because it was so painful. Um, and so... I, I really appreciated everything you shared and the images and the, the, the of, of what looked like archival materials and other newspapers and things like that. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, um, you know, the, the, the archival work, was it hard to find? Was it, you, you had alluded, I think you didn't say censored, but like sort of hidden, hidden papers and people disappearing. So I, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that, if you don't mind. Um, and then the other question is is a bit more direct and just about the the drop in population of about 15,000 people to about 4,000 people. Um, and I didn't know if those were at all related that people are being disappeared or hidden or removed or or, or married out, right? Like if, if this is also about family. So um, sorry if that's too big, please respond however you see fit. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for that question, uh, for these very important questions. I think. Um, so the archival research was very difficult because doing, I mean, doing archival research in Mexico is very tricky, um, just for the way they, are, they organize their materials, uh, but also because there are many papers that have been disappeared. And so uh, to fill those gaps, I try to draw on oral life history uh, to more or less triangulate the information that I was receiving. And what I found is that in some of my life uh, oral life history interviews with extended Mexican Japanese families, um, some people would say, like for example, Alex in the excerpt that I mentioned, that their grandparents or someone in their family had passed away, and that happened quite a lot. So I found many, many people, including in my family, who had died without an apparent reason, and we do not know much about that. And I think the archival research was complementary in that sense to try to construct a, a, a more accurate image of what might have happened. But I think, I mean, researching destruction, and this is something that I discussed in, in one of my classes um, before, it is very difficult because, of, I mean, there is a there is kind of like a ontology, a, a, an impossibility there that I think. Francois Lyotard has discussed in his book, Differ Difference. And, um, and, and for me, it has been mostly about, um, yes, trying to reconstruct a very imperfect picture of what happened. Um, and as for the other question, uh, sorry, and, and I think perhaps drawing on more archival resources would be useful. So I was very lucky because um, I had an, a research assistant who helped me even after I completed my PhD, my, my PhD field work to, to continue some of that archival research in Mexico in different archive, archival sites there. Uh, but I was very lucky because one colleague of mine from the University of Oxford, who is actually doing research on Macau, um, provided me with some uh, documents that she found in Lisboa, in the Portuguese archives, uh, because Portugal represented the interest of Japan during this period. And uh, so that is also a very important um, and, and a very important um, way of trying to add more elements to this understanding. Mm 
uh, yes, and for the other question, um, the thing is that um, the, this year relates mostly to Japanese people only, and those were uh, the ones that disappeared. But during the war, um, both Japanese people, that is those who were deemed by the Mexican state Japanese, and that included even those who were first or second or third generation Mexican Japanese, but also their families sometimes were uh, concentrated. So um, yes, I mean, I think that that question about intermarriages, whether that may reflect also a decrease, may be also connected to the way in which intermarriage, no, but it is, it, maybe it is not intermarriage, it is more like racial mixture as a state project might account for these genocidal practices. Because in many cases, it was something that was desired, but in many, many other instances, it was not. Great, thank you so much for that, for that answer. We have another uh, question maybe, it's, <clears throat> this is from the online audience. Uh, this is um, um, actually about, this is from Piero uh, Guerra, who says, uh, do you have any insight on the close connection between Japanese and Peruvian culture and politics, especially considering the Fujimori presidency? So insofar as you just talked about. Yes, thank you so much, Piero. He's one of my students. I'm very glad that you're, uh, you're here. And, and we welcome students' questions. Don't be shy if you have questions. Yes, yeah. I mean, that is a, that is such a, an important question, right? Because I have to say, I mean, before I answer your very important question, let me just say that when I began this research, I was told somewhere that there could not be anti-Japanese racism because Peru had had Alberto Fujimori as president. And so this is something that I have come across um, many times. And now I don't feel that upset about it, uh, but it's still a very relevant question for various reasons. Um, I mean, in the context of the US, we have Barack Obama, right? And many people think that we live in a post-racial world because a black man was president of the US, but we know that that is not true because racism is actually about a structure rather than individual presidents, uh, uh, prejudices or attitudes or achievements. And so I would say the same might be the case in Peru. I, I have not conducted research there, but from what I have read, it seems that, and actually there, there, there are some interesting works by uh, Takenawa, I think, who has written about uh, the Peruvian Japanese, who the, the Japanese Peruvians tend to be portrayed as very wealthy and powerful and um, and kind of nearly white, right? But we, we I mean, these are the narratives that we have available and there, there was something similar in relation to Mexican Japanese. So we may wish to excavate a little bit further into those representations to find uh, the experiences of all ordinary people, not only tokenistic successful cases, um, but I mean, Fujimori has, Fujimori is a very interesting site, I think, to explore, to explore these, these issues. And I would love it if you could write something about that. Thank you. So, Piero, you have homework now, um, but thank you for your question. That's great. Um, so, there's other questions here. Um, I have a question, though. So, I'm going to, since I have the mic, I'll, I'll, I'll ask. So first of all, thank you again so much for this, this talk. And I was wondering if you could go back to some of the, the really suggestive things you were saying. Um, I mean, I think it relates to the question just asked by Piero as well about, I guess, kind of how model minority discourse might operate in different spaces. And so whether that's in relation to US with Barack Obama, say, um, or in Peru with regard to certain kind of uh, positions and how that relates then, could you talk a little bit about maybe how that particular discourse um, in, as it relates to things like proximity to whiteness uh, operates maybe over time, I mean, what, kind of, what kind of shifts that you've seen in terms of how that, that discourse is deployed not necessarily in terms of like genocidal extermination that's happening earlier in, in the 20th century, but but now in terms of how um, how things are changing or things that you're uh, either particularly troubled by or particularly inspired by in terms of how scholarship has changed to incorporate that discourse. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for that very fascinating question, um, because this actually links my presentation today with the other chapters of my thesis that focus on how the experiences of the Japanese change over time. So while I refer to five generations of Mexican Japanese, I'm actually, I use the generational aspect as time sets to trace changes over the last decades 
and uh, how the shifting position of Japan actually also impacts on the on the way in which the Japanese and people of Japanese origins are are read or interpreted or approaching in in contexts like Mexico, for example. And so I I what I found is that um, Japanese identity was a very stigmatized identity up until the fourth generation. So people who were born in the 90s. It was even long after Japan achieved, kind of recovered from the war and had its economic boom and became a cultural uh, relevant player. Um, so for the fourth generation descendants of Japanese, like myself, for example, um, this association with Japan can be can be can can be seen as accruing some sort of capital, cultural capital in particular. But it depends very much also on uh, on on different factors. So it is not a very stable identity. It has to do with whether you uh, you 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 people think that you look Japanese or that you don't. And in many cases, for uh, Mexican Japanese. Uh, there have been so many intermarriages because that is the racial project of mestizaje in comparison with the US where there is more racial segregation and so on. Um, so they may they may lack that, or it may appear to some that they lack that. Um, but it also relies very much on names as well and uh, knowledge of Japanese culture and other practices. Um, However, in, 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 in that specific chapter in which I write about the experiences of fourth generation descendants of Japanese people in Mexico, uh, what I show is that that can also backfire because the more associated to Japanese-ness that you are perceived, the more exclusion you will face from participating fully in national spaces. So while it seems that it accrues some sort of cultural capital, it also uh, works in detriment of your uh, political and social participation in, in the nation. So I suppose that that idea of model minority exposes those limits that you're, you do not get to occupy that space of whiteness. Yes. Thank you. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah sure. There's a follow up. Yeah, just for, I mean, thank you for a really fascinating, wonderful presentation today. Just a follow-up was um, about naming practices. So um, do people, or have people been able to, or wanted to remove their Japanese sounding surname, for example, in order to sort of take, get away from this sort of minority status that it, that it sort of engenders? Yes, yes, absolutely. That's something that I came across quite a lot people who had removed their Japanese name completely. Because for actually, I would say that for the, ma for the vast majority of Mexican Japanese, it's actually not that positive, even today, especially because most of them are the offspring of mixed marriages and crossing racial boundaries actually elicits a lot of violence, as I mentioned from the very beginning of my presentation. Um, so yes, that's something that I found. Uh, during the war, there were many um, mothers or parents who did that, and that carried on. And it was only much later, due to a random incident, like a casual encounter with a Japanese person or um, the discovery of some family documents, uh, kind of unintentionally, that they learned that they had Japanese ancestry. Um, Yes, and I, I think at, at present, yes, perhaps, yes, I, I, I mean, I didn't look at that specifically on my work, on my thesis, but I think there are ambivalent feelings about naming um, the people or the children with Japanese names or not. Mm. Yeah, I hope I answered that question. Oh, yes. In Japan and sort of the the sort of um, sim not similarities because it's very different histories, but the ways that names became such a sort of flashpoint and continue to be such a flashpoint with you know Zainichi Koreans not knowing that they are originally Zainichi Korean oh. until later on they see sort of their registration and you know family registration um, files and things like that. So I was just sort of thinking about the crossovers between 
those different sort of histories of colonialism yes. um, from different positionalities. But yeah, you totally answered my question. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for mentioning the Sainichi here, because actually something that I did find in my research, research and this relates to names as well, is that among the, I mean, I try to write about Mexicans of Japanese origin, and I refer to origins not as something kind of as an ontological given, you know, but actually as originating from Japan, but that doesn't mean that they are, you know, kind of part of this idea of homogeneous Japan. And some of them were actually uh, Korean, but their families with the process of migration had changed their name because, and same with, the same happens with Okinawan people as well, and for, possibly with Rakuyumin or who, other stigmatized groups. And so it is, it, I think it is very interesting because then they are subjected to other levels of violence, right? Because they have not only been dispossessed of their own identities, but they were subjected to anti-Japanese racism. And nowadays they might have a total lack of understanding of their own experiences and, and positions and so on. So yes, that, that's also something that I found. And I, I just want to say that uh, the Mexican state Actually, the Latin, Latin American governments decided to implement these policies not only against Japan, for example, but also their uh, colonial subjects. So that meant that Korean in Mexico were also uh, subjected to these policies. Thank you. Um, so Rich, uh, we have time for, I think, maybe one more question or so. Uh, this is one from, it might be a good one to end on, in fact. This is from Henry Garcia who says, uh, thanks, Dr. Fernandez de Lara Harada, a very interesting presentation. Could you expand upon how your work on the Mexican Japanese is important to Japanese studies and a wider global context? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, that is a very tricky question. I, I still keep asking that myself, like, why am I, what am I doing here and those kind of things, but. Giving great talks. Well. <laughs> thank you. Um, I mean, Perhaps uh, an anecdote might help to illuminate that question in some ways. When we were writing this article that I mentioned about the national apologies with my colleagues from the University of Victoria and other places, uh, there was a debate about what term to use to describe anti-Japanese uh, persecution and anti-Japanese racist policies during the war. And it was very interesting for me because uh, some of the Japanese colleagues were saying, no, it should be anti-Nikkei, anti Nikkei racism, right? And I was like, no, but Nikkei emerged much, much later. These people, as we can see in the records, were racial as, as Japanese. And to me, this seemed a, a move to sanitize Japanese history and to, at the expense of the likes of so many other people, right? I mean, there are not many Japanese people who are interested in this talk, um, right? And there is an investment in forgetting these histories. And I think whiteness also operates through oblivion, right? Uh, and I think that is part of that, that discussion on how the Japanese may want to position themselves there. Um, so I suppose that my research is very important because it compels us to not forget. And that is, that is these histories are part of Japanese history. Yes, regardless of whether people decide to disavow them or or forget them. And they are not only part of Japanese history, but they are part of how Japan operates today. I mean, they give account of how racism operates within Japan and among the Japanese in relation to people who have been uh, dispossessed. Hmm. I hope that answers that question. Thank you, Henry, for that. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that. Um, and I think that, um, all of these answers are, are really phenomenal and it's given us, I think, all so much to think about. I mean, I'll say maybe just uh, maybe to close that that um, um, Henry Garcia's question about, you know, why this research is important to Japanese studies. I, I don't know that everybody in Japanese studies um, would feel that way, but um, I think the, us, we here, um, really value this kind of research, partially because in the kind of transdisciplinary nature of what you're doing and working between a kind of critical ethnic studies and kind of history and also sociology, for instance, you're doing really exciting things that generally speaking are far off the radar of kind of Japanese studies as traditionally configured. And 
um, I think the kind of blind spots that are constitutive of Japanese studies are, you know, when you say that what you're doing is interrupting or kind of exposing the limits of Japanese studies, it's exactly this kind of research that's blending oral history and um, thinking about these absences and um, kind of theorize those in ways that don't fit within either an area studies paradigm, you know, or a kind of straight kind of kind of um, kind of monoethnic frame is is really not just exciting but also um, challenging in the best of ways to what Japanese studies is usually configured as. So um, some folks might might disagree, but I, I really hope that you can continue in this vein. And we're really excited for your your book manuscript um, and and uh, really appreciate your being here to share your expertise and uh, wisdom with us today. So with that said, I think we're at time. So please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Jessica A. Fernandez de la Harara for her wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you very much.